everybody to the first episode of Paideia Today. I am Dr. Bill Friesen. Um, I am a specialist in early medieval literatures, though I've taught right across the canon, everything from classical literatures right up to cutting edge science fiction and fantasy. Uh, I have my PhD from the University of Toronto. I studied uh, under the supervision of Dr. Andy Orchard, who is now the Bosworth and Rawlinson Chair of Anglo-Saxon over at Oxford. And beside me here is Dr. Scott Masson. Tell me a bit about yourself. Yeah, hi, uh, Dr. Scott Masson. I was a wannabe English uh, medievalist. I uh, ended up not following that route. I grew up here in Canada, but I uh, filled in my lack of languages by going to the University of Dusseldorf to study classical languages there, Greek and Latin. Uh, fired an enthusiasm for uh, learning there and uh, eventually went to the University of Durham and did my master's and PhD in Romantic Literature, both German and English, and uh, then came back to Canada. So we started this venture with uh, the idea of wanting to present knowledge that we believe is being lost in our time. And not just lost accidentally, but by a, an intentional act of oblivion uh, commitment to progressivism, really. The idea that whatever is newest and whatever is newest is best, that the model of your smartphone is the model for all learning, and thinking that this was something that uh, we want to preserve and record for, for others to benefit from, uh, preserving something that's been passed on to us uh, as a really a sacred matter, and uh, we share that view. Yeah, it's uh, as somebody who specializes in the literature of a dark age, I find uh, our current circumstance, culturally and, and literarily, um, rather striking because I think we are in danger of losing so much nowadays. And to some extent, uh, this is because to, to some degree, there is an indifference, there is, a, there is a lack of skill, there is a lack of inclination to read this kind of literature and to read it in the way that it was once read. Mm. That's, a, a, that's a skill set all unto itself which takes years and years to build up. Uh, and to a huge extent, very few people nowadays actually have that skill set in hand and more strikingly are willing to pass it on. And so this is one of the endeavors that we're, we're very keen on right now. We want to pass on not just the content, but the way of engaging with that content that's going to enrich people in ways that Western readers have been enriched for 2,500, 2,300 years. It's very, it's very much at the forefront of what we want to do. Years ago, I read a little essay by C.S. Lewis, and he talked about chronological snobbery, uh, which is really the consequence of progressivism. Mm -hmm. And it's the, really what I talked about just a second ago, the idea that whatever is, uh, what the, the way we look at the world today is uh, the best way uh, and the reason that it's the best is we can look at the world uh, and the scientific and technological accomplishments of our day and point to them as the indicator of our superiority to the past. And, and largely this is a confirmation bias, but it's also a self-fulfilling prophecy. We cut ourselves off from the past mm -hmm. and largely become forgetful of the things that brought us to this point of progress, which I'm not denying that there is technological process. We're using one of the consequences of it right here by doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. But the idea that uh, human nature has been improved in the process, I vehemently dispute, and I think it's simply wrong, and we can see the consequences in our day. So at, at the moment, political discourse as we speak is full of anger, of wrath, and uh, vehemence, and uh, on both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, and it's largely because there isn't a common civic ground of discourse and uh, civilization and that's a that's also a consequence of this educational paradigm i think to a large extent there is a notion that we are uh, especially in terms of culture we are superior to ages which have gone before but when we say that we're superior to those ages which are, have gone before and if you actually press somebody who's making that assertion either implicitly or explicitly uh, you'll find that either a uh, they have a very wrong and crude conception of the cultural inheritance that was on offer up until recently, um, or they have no idea at all. There's a complete vacuum there, a complete ignorance as to what went before and what we're saying we're better than. Hmm. Um, so maybe you believe that better, what better went... is a comparative, right? Uh -huh. Yes, exactly. So what are you comparing it to? Are you comparing it to some kind of literary straw man? Are you comparing it to a complete vacuum? What are you comparing that to? And if you actually become familiar with uh, 
that cultural inheritance, in this case in the form of literature, and the ways in which it was meant traditionally to be read, and then you want to judge it and say, no, I prefer where we're going right now with literature, well then that's legitimate. Now we sure. can have an informed discussion between civilized people who are educated in these matters. But first you have to know what you don't know. This is right. the beginning of wisdom. Right. But, but the product of our contemporary education is a culture that really doesn't know anything about the past. But vilifies it. But vilifies it at the same time. Correct. And, and that's, uh, I described it as a, as a willful amnesia, which is a consequence of progressivism. Anything, anybody who knows anything about amnesiacs is they don't know who they are. Right. Uh, in addition to that, which is a terrifying prospect, by the way, not knowing who you are and trying to construct your own identity. But the other thing about it is an amnesiac is also not to be trusted by those who are around the amnesiac because they have no stable sense of themselves by which others can reckon what they're going to do. Now, in our day, we think that we're beyond bloodshed and conflict and barbarism, but there's no reason why we should think that that is the case. And with the rising levels of hostility and animosity in our civil discourse, I think that that is where it is going. Yeah, when you see, I mean, people thought this as well during the time uh, of the rise of the Nazis. Right. And, and it ended up, with they used technology and advancements precisely in order to perform absolute barbaric acts. Yeah. Um, so what guides the tools of knowledge? What guides the science? There's another thing here I, I want to mention while we're at it. The agenda of literature in our day is radically different than ever it has been in the past. And I don't think we're being critical enough about that. Nowadays, uh, literature is very much about ideology. It's very much, uh, to use crude language, it's, it's very much a platform for propaganda. Yep. Uh, there are particular worldviews, uh, social views, domestic views, political views. Um, which are the primary reason to communicate those and convince people of the merit of those and the, the demerits of others, yes. Yeah. I think somebody even 150, 200 years ago would have found such an assertion impossibly crude and uncivilized. 50 years ago. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to be generous. And I, I think we're raising up a generation now where not only is literature about ideology, propaganda, um, but fanatical propaganda. This is extremism. And so to some extent I also want this uh, this series to be a moderating influence as well as an enriching influence when it comes to culture, generally speaking, and literature specifically speaking. So the agenda is, we, w we were talking amongst ourselves beforehand and wanted to talk about pietas, this word which is so important for Virgil and his hero Aeneas. And which is the root of the word piety, obviously. Right. And it was the reverence for one's forebears. In his case, it was the you know revering the household gods and and so forth. And That's right. In not our, just not just that, but also what they represented. Right, uh, and that exists in quite frankly almost all cultures. A reverence for those that have gone before you, for the wisdom that they've accrued, for the, the what the wisdom represents, and the uh, the knowledge that there's a sacred duty to pass that on down. That is something that we think is an antidote to the, again, the, the ideological, agenda-driven approach to the humanities, which are really, are no longer really the humanities. They, they've really cut themselves off from the, the roots of wisdom. They don't, in some cases, even uh, have those because it hasn't been taught to them. And so we're worried, uh, but, but not without hope, that we can pass on the wisdom that we've learned from decades of study That's right. uh, and uh, holding and passing on the sacred flame that was passed on to us. And I think we also have to remember that it's not just a reverence, it's not just an attitude bound up in pietas, it's also it's a commitment to action. In our case it's you know making episodes like these, but it's, it's a sense of not just your duties towards the past, but there is very much a, a living sense of your sacred duties to those who went before, what they have asserted, the wisdom they have passed on, uh, and their very identity, and how that's all bound up in a single sort of package. We're not just thinking about these things, we're not just reverent towards these things, we're not just admiring something in a sort of a nostalgic and sentimental spirit. There's a call to action here, and like I said before, as somebody who has taught the literature of the Dark Ages and seen entire cultures lose all the inheritance that went before, this is a particularly driving and poignant thing to me. This is something that really strikes a chord with me. Mm.
So the podcast is called Paideia Today. Um, it was chosen quite deliberately, as you'd imagine. Uh, the word Paideia is the Greek word for culture or education. It's a really comprehensive term. It's the word that's used by Paul in Ephesians 6 verse 4. Uh, let me read that exact verse. He says that fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The word discipline there is uh, paideia, and instruction is nuthesia, which has an element of fear in it. Um, when he does that, he is obviously using a word that was used by the Greeks. So the word paideia is a Greek word, and it relates to the um, upbringing of a, of a child, uh, which was a pace so from which we get pediatric and so forth. But it's also, uh, it has Hebrew roots, and it has Hebrew roots in Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you are to teach these things to your children. And that teaching mandate, which is given to children, uh, is first of all, note that the, that the great commandment, the greatest commandment that Jesus was asked is quoted there in the Shema, and it's to pass on that education to one's children. And so our, our aim here is to really follow the Apostle Paul in this and, and Hebrew, thinking on this, but even the Greek secular world, we think there's a common uh, strain of importance of passing on as a matter of utmost importance, as a matter of not only loving the Lord, but loving our neighbor, but also a cultural aspect. So in, in that Deuteronomy text, it talks about having it bound on your forehead and on your wrists and on your uh, the doorposts of your, of your home and on the city gates. So talking about your thoughts, your actions, your domestic life, and your civic life. Paideia encompasses all of those things. And we think that they, or you may agree, you may not agree, but I'm pretty sure you do. Uh, my sense of this podcast is it's not just introducing us to the sacred texts of old, um, but it's, it's giving a whole worldview that comes with that. Yeah, I think uh, we live in an age, particularly in the West, where your values fundamentally constitute your identity are at least implicitly uh, said to be private yeah. um, and you, you can't deploy them out there in the world and it doesn't matter if your values are ethical or aesthetic, artistic, what have you, there's stuff that you keep to yourself more or less or maybe a small circle of like-minded people. That is not what uh, idea implies. It implies a very holistic response whereby you're out in the forum, you're out in the public world deploying those values. Maybe other people disagree with you and you disagree with them in terms of these values, but it's a civilized uh, conversation and you negotiate where you land on these things, the truth of these matters. It's, it's, it's very much a conversation. It's not an echo chamber at all. Right. Uh, it gets deployed also in the home. I think this is another interesting aspect of it here. Nowadays, there's a, a tacit understanding that for the most part institutions will do the educating or the no, experts yes the experts whoever they are and of course this is perhaps a little bit uh, ironic uh, when you're actually listening to two doctors of literature but nevertheless the implications here that scott just talked about are that uh, this education starts in the home it starts with parents it starts uh, behind closed doors if you like and institutions will get involved in these sorts of things uh, but nowadays it's it's as if the world is uh, upside down with this, where the institutions demand not just the right to educate the children or, or the people who, who lack knowledge, but they dem demand it exclusively yeah. and they want to cut the parents out. This would never have been countenanced even 50, 100 years ago. This is a new thing uh, and it comes with a very different kind of authority than has been a tri uh, traditionally associated with this kind of education. Though it is concurrent with the rise of public education, it's not the same thing, it's not the same motive, but uh, Dewey and progressivist educational models explicitly sought to do precisely what's happening. But let, let's, um, I think that's really good, and uh, I, I want to switch gears a little bit here and ask you the question, Bill. Sure. Because I know something of your story, but I don't know the whole story. We didn't script this. So how did you come by your love of literature? <laughs> If it's not obvious already, we can script this. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I came to it strangely and through the back door, if you like. When I was growing up, I grew up on a farm uh, and on trap lines and things like this. Um, my parents were... Out in BC, right? Out in, out in British Columbia, in the interior, in the middle of nowhere. 
And my parents uh, are of Mennonite extraction, ultimately, and so there was, at best, an indifference to cultural matters in literature in particular. I found a love of reading, curiously, through my father. My father would talk about watching uh, Tarzan movies when he was a kid uh, over at the theater and stuff like this, but of course they didn't air those anymore, but I spotted at one point when I was eight a Tarzan novel. And it was unedited, unabridged, so it was meant for elevated readers, and certainly not for an eight-year-old, uh, but I didn't care. I loved my father, and I loved uh, the stuff he talked about, and so I wanted to check out Tarzan of the Apes, and I read it, and I devoured it. And I think it was two days. And very shortly thereafter, I discovered Lord of the Rings, and I devoured those as well. I remember lying on the hay bales up in the hayloft with the sun going down and trying to read by the red gold light uh, the last words of uh, Fellowship of the Ring. And my father very quickly uh, noticed my love of reading and began to oppose it. <laughs> and he would actually forbid me from reading. <laughs> I had to get out and do practical stuff out in the world. Um, and uh, if I wanted to read, I risked my father's wrath, speaking of uh, pietas and, and fathers and everything. Oh. Curiously, uh, school experience didn't help my love of literature or reading at all. I didn't know what literature was. I was not a very good English student. I averaged C's, C minuses on a good day. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't care less, if I'm honest. And, uh, but my love of reading continued uh, unassuaged. And uh, so uh, when I finally went back to university after about 10 years in the world, the last thing I thought I would be doing was getting into literature. But when I went to university uh, west, uh, initially during my undergraduate, uh, I located first of all a love of literature, but then a love very specifically of literatures which weren't very high profile anymore. It started with you know, simple things like Shakespeare and you know the metaphysical poets and things like that. But then I began to delve further and further into the past until I locked onto my my great love of uh, Old English and Anglo-Latin literature. Beowulf, of course, got me into this, and mm -hmm. the Battle of Malt and what have you. Mm -hmm. But I found this lost world just intoxicating, and I thought, how do I, how do I get into this further? How do I enrich my studies of this? How do I deepen uh, and make more manifest that love? And I realized there was an ocean of things I did not know, yeah. and there was nobody to teach me. Yeah. And so, like many uh, great figures in the past, you know, John Milton's and so on, uh, I realized I have to, I'm going to have to educate myself. And so that's exactly what I began doing as I went through my undergraduate and then I got into my master's studies and I got uh, deeply involved in uh, the classics, the Iliad, the Aeneid, Ovid, uh, all these people, much more obscure works, you know, Sedulius and, and people like this. Uh, and it just took off from there. And then when I came to the University of Toronto, I was well positioned, both in terms of the institution and my own previous training to really deepen a proper, disciplined, liberal arts education during my PhD. And it has served me well since. And partially out of a kind of a mimetic impulse here, you know, you, you, you want to repeat and pass on yep. what you love. And that's instinctive, it's not strategic. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to be self-conscious about it. If you hear something good and fascinating, you will either imitate it, you will, you know, uh, write your own work of art or if, you know your favorite song comes on the radio you'll hum along to it mm -hmm. you see something interesting you'll find the most important person in your day it's your spouse your boyfriend your girlfriend whoever it might be and you immediately tell them you want to hand it on and for me that's that's become a teaching impulse if i love this thing i want to hand on this thing why because it's good it's valuable it's enriching it's mm -hmm. it's a lost world that other people need to hear about yeah so that's that's my and then how long have you been teaching, Bill? Uh, 19 years at the university level. It's probably one of the most fulfilling things I do mm. uh, with my life. I, I simply love teaching. Just watching the students light up when they hear about this and watching them make the connections and hearing that awe oh, sweep through the classroom as all of a sudden everybody gets a certain deep point yeah. as you're teaching. Yeah. You're pulling it all together. Yeah. That's enough about me. Let's talk a little bit about your background. Uh, well, mine was somewhat similar. I didn't have anyone who forbade me from reading. <laughs> That's particularly funny and colorful. Yeah. And I didn't have a career, uh, an amateur career in boxing either, but, uh, no. but we won't get into that for now. <laughs> uh, maybe some other time. Uh, I loved reading as a kid. I devoured uh, what was put in front of me. I remember my dad 
saying to me, read this, it's classical literature, it was H, when I say classical, things like H.G. Wells, sci-fi, H. Ryder Haggard, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, loving that sort of thing. I actually didn't read Tolkien until I was in my 30s, believe it or not, despite, uh, no, yeah, it's really odd. But like you, Bill, I, when I went to school, I was not really interested in English literature and did similarly poorly, 60s, um, until I got towards the end of high school and I realized I had to pick up my grades mm. and then did so sufficiently to bring me, me in. But then I failed my very first English essay <laughs> in uh, university, which I always tell my students uh, as an encouragement after I failed them. Uh, <laughs> um, You're a monster. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. But I, when I came to university, I didn't know I wanted to do English at all. I, I, I was uh, inscribed to do business, so I did I had business, economics, math, psych, and English. Mm -hmm. And I found them interesting, but the only one that really grabbed me was the English. Mm -hmm. uh, in part because I was exposed for the first time to great works of literature, medieval texts, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, Paradise mm -hmm. Lost, and so forth. And so I decided to switch a course, and uh, so I grew up in London. Uh, Scottish extraction. My father, at any rate, my mother is actually part Mohawk, so that's something I discovered later in life. Um, that's another story. Uh, finished my undergrad with increasing desire to learn more, so much so that my medieval professor, uh, who had studied at, the, under, at Oxford with Tolkien and Lewis, um, and really fired me with interest to be a medievalist, said you should go to Toronto and talk to them about what you need to do this. And so I went to PIMS and the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies and they said, you need to know languages. And part of me was resentful, I have to say, and Bill probably had the same experience of what I didn't have and what I thought I ought to have had right. in order to, um, at a, at, even at the undergrad level, to be considered to be a um, educated, cultivated human being. I didn't think I had it and I wanted to get it. So I went, uh, to Germany to do languages because they said you need Latin, you need German, French, two or three languages. I went to Germany, I studied classics there um, through German, so I learned German from scratch, discovered I had an aptitude for learning uh, languages which I didn't know I had. Uh, so I became a German translator, uh, studied Greek and Latin to a pretty basic level, um, classical Greek and Latin. Uh, then realized I didn't want to spend my life uh, as a classicist at any rate, wanted some sort of uh, application to it and, and wanted to uh, recover what I found in my English degree, which was really, I found Christianity through literature. Um, and so I didn't go to a church, this is part of a, sort of a Christian testimony, and I'm not going to go there. But that was actually why I continued to study literature. I knew there was something more than simply you know, frills, cultural frills, there's something really deeply important. So I went to the University of Durham uh, and studied English and German literature and uh, then went on to the PhD level and, and completed that there. And uh, then I uh, came back to Canada and all told, I've been teaching for about 19 years at the, at the university level as well. Mm -hmm. So that's how we came by our love of literature. It, for me, it was just a growing uh, sense. The more I got, the deeper I wanted to drink. And, uh, and then to pass it on, there's that same love when you see the students catch the same fire that I experienced as an undergrad. That's just like, so I love teaching first year English, actually. Yeah. yeah. Really. Yeah, watching the student light up, that's, that's a wonderful moment. Um, and they'll often say to you afterwards, and soon, the wake of having been taught all this, or some of this, the, the journey never really ends, that uh, you've changed my life forever. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a different human being. And that's enormously gratifying because, quite frankly, at the end of the day, it's not me who's done that. It is uh, all these generations who have gone before. Hmm. I'm, I'm not a vessel from which they drink. I'm a conduit through which this has flowed. Right. flowed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there has to be a degree of humility that comes along with this as well. Mm -hmm. And I realized, like you, Scott, uh, that literature is very much about identity, but not identity in the modern sort of cheap, shallow sense. It's about the values that constitute the core of your identity. Uh, and that the worlds being projected, to use Aristotelian language here, the worlds being projected are possible worlds, but those possible worlds are conformed 
by certain value sets, and the value sets of both individuals and also the value sets of cultures, and we'll have to talk in, in later episodes about what constitutes culture. Sure. I know you've got to take on this, I've got to take on this as well, and I think there's a fair degree of overlap there. Yeah. So, the texts are the documents of individuals insofar as they're the product of an individual author, but the, the texts are also, of course, cultural artifacts as well. And the core of those, uh, those cultures uh, are the value sets that come along with them. Yeah. And as you say, when you get into them, you realize just how much you don't know. Yeah. And to me, at the end of my undergraduate work, this, this was the big crisis. I was catching glimpses, I was catching shadows of a world that had gone before, of the impossible beauty and complexity and richness and goodness, and oftentimes horror and fear and ugliness as well, because they look at these things as well. This is not all sunny ways. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's a world that I still continue to explore. It's, the great works of literature can be read again and again and again. Lewis said this. He's, he one of the tests of whether or not uh, a text is merely a current sensational cultural one-off or whether or not it's potentially one of the great works of literature is can you come back to it and be enriched every time you read it. Right. And something like Paradise Lost or Dante's Commedia or Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, you can do that. Yeah, it will stand if you are trained to read critically and deeply, they will return your investment every yeah. single time. And yeah. I think that's that's one of the most magnificent things about a literary life. And you don't have to be a professor to enjoy that. I think it used to be the inheritance of any educated man or woman. Yep. Yeah. And they would assume certain things, the very complex, rich things which they didn't have to articulate explicitly. They no. would imply it or say something and everyone else in the room would go, oh, and they would nod at you know, the mm -hmm. eloquence and, mm -hmm. and the elegance of what had been articulated there. And we can't do that anymore. We, we live in a world which is uh, oftentimes incredibly breathtakingly crude and willfully ugly. Yeah. And I think that's, that's unfortunate. And this is a, this is a, a balm towards that in mm -hmm. some sense. So we're going to cover uh, on this podcast series um, the great works of literature, by and large, since literature is our area of main expertise. Mm -hmm. Literature includes not just uh, aesthetic matters, it does include uh, ethical matters, political matters, pretty much religious matters, pretty much everything, because all of those things matter to those who write these texts. Uh, it's not a discipline which is isolated from the others, it's involved in them, and that's again part of the paideia. Uh, that, that broad cultural sense of everything being related to everything else and holding together in a unity which can be passed on and comprehended and, and revered and, uh, and appreciated. So we're, we'll, we'll start off with the ancient Greeks. Yep. Uh, I think we'll start off with the Iliad, uh, that great or perhaps the greatest work of literature. I think we actually both agree that it is yep. uh, there. And then we'll move to the Odyssey. And we'll, We'll, we'll go forward uh, in terms of the organization. I think we're going to sort of wing it. Um, there are certain topics we want to cover and texts we want to cover, but we're not quite sure how long it will take us to get through them. We don't want to do it exhaustively. We want to whet your appetite and not spend uh, two years on the Iliad, although it probably could, you could probably, take probably take that, but that would be for a, a course. Uh, and you would want to do it in depth here. So, and the purpose of that is to try and reach uh, teachers, uh, homeschooling parents, and even just adults who want to backfill the education they didn't get. I think that's the intended You have a sense that they, there's an inheritance there that uh, they haven't had access to. We're going to be, as Scott says here, we're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to start with Greek epic, and that's going to start with the Iliad, and then probably over to the Odyssey. And from there, we're going to move on to a very likely Greek drama, tragedy, comedy, these sorts of matters. And we'll put together an entire series on that. Likewise, as Scott says, we're not going to rush it, on the other hand. We're, uh, we're going to go where the conversation takes us. So not scripting things painfully and excruciatingly is actually deliberately part of our strategy here. We want this to be a flexible, organic sort of a discussion. Uh, after we're done with that, of course, we're going to turn our attention to uh, Roman literature. Uh, again, the epic uh, features very strongly there, but there are also other aspects of Roman literature we need to talk about. Mm. The Iliad is one of the most inf But then Virgil, when he writes the Aeneid, is responding back to that. And then when Dante is writing the Commedia, he's responding back to that as well. And when Milton is writing Paradise Lost, he's responding back to that. And it goes on and on and on. Through the Romantics. Through the Romantics. And then abruptly, as we come up on the 20th century, 
it stops. We stop talking about the great conversation strands. Yeah, although the great modern uh, writers like uh, Joyce writes his Ulysses and uh, Derek Walcott writes Omeros, mm -hmm. which is again, these are all knowledgeable writers, the great writers, Nobel Prize winning authors, but they're speaking to an audience that largely doesn't know the text that they're alluding to. That's right. Anyway. That's right. Should that be enough for today? I think, yeah, let's, let's draw that to a close. Good.